starting to record and well, maybe I'll just share. I'm just sharing my webcam to say hi to everyone joining the lecture um, in person and those who will be listening to the recording. And now I'm going to to start with the slides and um, yeah. Okay, here we are. So this is this is um, a difficult or challenging kind of presentation to do. It's challenging for me, and I think it may be challenging for some of you who are survivors of forced psychiatry or related kinds of forced interventions that, that are based in some idea of us being inferior, having inferior minds or bodies to other people that someone else needs to fix. It's a very painful experience because of the because of the discrimination and degrading the degradation that comes along with that <clears throat> as well as the the deprivation of bodily autonomy and the harm done by these forced interventions inherently what it means to you know, to, to experience some of the effects of neuroleptic drugs or electroshock when it is being done to you against your will and something is, is taking over your consciousness that you, you didn't ask to have happen to you and that can be very frightening. So just to... Yes, invite people to um, think about what your own experiences may have been or the experiences you've, you've, you know that other people have had um, and, and, and understand we, we can make space for whatever emotional issues or aspects we need to deal with, the um, experiences of grief and loss and anger that come up in relation to these things um, and recognize that it's valuable to name the experience as, or I guess I'm, I'm sort of maybe getting ahead of myself, but I have experienced it as valuable to name the experience as a form of torture. We can say torture or ill treatment, but I have argued that Forced psychiatry, such as forced drugging or electroshock, can meet and does meet the the criteria to be defined as as torture. So, um, okay, I think we'll just start going into the slides now. I have an outline of general issues, definitions of torture, and application of this definition to forced psychiatric interventions. WNUSP framing in the CRPD negotiations, how we, how we, how we worded this issue of defining forced psychiatric interventions as, as torture and other ill treatment, the, a sort of development of that the prohibition of forced interventions under the CRPD, application of the torture framework, challenges and opportunities and reparations. There's a lot of material in, in this um, lecture. So I think I, I addressed some of this on approaching this issue, the impact on victims as survivor activists working as human rights defenders and survivors seeking justice Beyond what I said about needing to deal with the emotional aspects if we're advocates and human rights defenders or if we're seeking justice for ourselves, we have to be aware of how it's affecting us 
or we, we might want to be aware of how it's affecting us so we can um, be able to deal with the emotional aspects for ourselves in whatever way we need to. And I think we also need to understand that the impact of these experiences and the societal silencing about the fact that forced psychiatry is a form of violence, that we react to it with, with experiences of grief and anger and um, it's something we need to heal from, there's a silencing of that in general. And it may make it more difficult for many people to actually try now that even now that we have the CRPD, it's difficult for many people to, to, to be able to come forward and talk about these experiences as human rights violations because it's been silenced for so long. Another thing that has happened sometimes, there's a, we, we get a defensive reaction of perpetrators and apologists, people in the mental health system who practice forced interventions and those who may not do it themselves, but think it's the right thing to do. So once I had a reaction from a psychologist when I was giving a presentation about laying out the, the analysis and the application of the criteria of torture to force psychiatric interventions, and he reacted saying, are you calling me a torturist? And, and I believe something like that happened in another context also. And despite however much we do our best not to personalize these things, we will get these defensive reactions. And we need to be able to, to be prepared as human rights defenders to um, at least know that we may encounter these reactions and, and think about how to deal with them the most constructively because we don't want those kind of reactions to stop what we're doing if, if, you know, when we understand that this is the right, the thing we need to do. Okay, so I hear that people are, are not able to, oh, are not, people are not able to, now, can you see my screen now? I don't know why it was not working before, but I hope you can see it now. Great. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, the first part was just the outline, and now you can see this the, the current slide that I'm looking at. So the, the, the positive value that I, or one of the positive values that I see to framing forced psychiatric interventions as torture is that we, we, we can do something with the experience and the naming of our experiences as a kind of violence by making legal and moral claims through the impersonal language of law. For some of us, that is, is a useful thing to do. We see that we can make it actionable. We can translate our our or our, our pain or trauma or grief or anger into a language that allows us to take action, to bear witness to, to, to work for the ending of, of these violations, and also to, to make it known, to make a social and legal and moral space to address the fact that this is violence and violence has consequences in in our lives and it has consequences for society and for the perpetrators and for everyone around us that these violent acts have been legitimized to you know to uh, until now by law so by putting it in the legal and moral framework of of uh, the prohibition of of torture and other forms of ill treatment, we can 
we can advance our legal and moral claims both to have these practices ended and also to to seek justice in whatever form we might want to and we can talk more about that with reparations survivor knowledge um for many of us this coming to understand ourselves as survivors of of forced psychiatric interventions what does it mean to say we're survivors we need to make sense of what happened to us the people who did it might have been saying this was the right thing to do this was good for us they needed to do it to us they might be they might be an act perplexed that we that we're angry about it how do we make sense of this extreme disconnection between our experience and what other people are saying about it, especially the people who did it, but not only them. There are no words to specifically describe forced psychiatry as a crime or an act of violence. We can analogize or experience aspects of this um, act of violence as state repression, as either similar to rape or sexualized violence or or having aspects of rape and sexualized violence as a form of enslavement, dehumanization, persecution, and torture. Those are some of the kinds of concepts that 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 I have ended up relating to my experience and that other people have also and in the end, the concept of torture held the most potential as an actual legal and moral claim. So um, I could talk more about that and how I analyzed the various other possibilities. <laughs> and, 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 and also there was a person, a writer named Richard Gostin, who who wrote about forced psychiatric interventions primarily as a violation of the right to freedom of thought and i think that has also has potential value and i chose the framing of torture because i think it was it's important to bring out the the violence and the violation of bodily autonomy um and integrity so I am arguing, and I have argued, that this is, with respect to torture, this is literal. It's not only a metaphor or analogy. The definition of torture in international law is broad enough to encompass the acts, say, of forced drugging, forced or coerced drugging, forced or coerced electroshock, restraint and seclusion and it's not only a metaphor or analogy when we use that language so here we are in the the definition of torture used that's when 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 we want to define torture as a violation of international law the most common definition used is in article one of the convention against torture and so it says this is this is a quote i didn't have quotation marks but this is a, a, a direct quote for the purposes of this convention the term torture means any act by which severe pain or suffering whether physical or mental is intentionally inflicted on a person. So that's the first part of the definition. You look for whether there's severe pain or suffering. The suffering can be physical or mental, and it must be intentionally inflicted. Intentional is distinguished here from accidental. Anyone can, can, can cause an accident, and that's different from an act of physical aggression against another person that that is your deliberate action on their body so that's the meaning of intentional here 
It doesn't have to be that you want the person to experience pain or suffering, but you engage in this act of physical aggression. So rape also qualifies as torture. And, and rape is another example besides forced psychiatric interventions where apologists and perpetrators may be saying, this, this isn't about, you know, I didn't want the person to suffer. And so we're not talking about that. We're not talking about um, the mind of the perpetrator and how they justify things to themselves when you commit an act of physical aggression on another person's body that causes them severe pain or suffering, physical or mental, that's the first, um, the first element of this definition of torture. Then it continues, for such purposes as obtaining from him or a third person information or a confession, punishing him or her, this was written before we developed non-sexist language, punishing him or her for an act he or she or a third person has committed or is suspected of having committed, or intimidating or coercing him or her or a third person, or for any reason based on discrimination of any kind. So we see in the case of forced psychiatry, the clearest, the clearest um, way that that is, is that that element is satisfied is that it's based on discrimination in that these forced interventions are always based on an idea that there's something wrong with us, something wrong with our mind, with our brain, with our behavior, that, that the, 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 the medical um, perpetrators believe that they can see this thing that's wrong with us that we can't see and that they need to, in their minds, fix or treat by these violent treatments. Um, so it's essentially the discrimination is in viewing something about us as requiring a violent correction. And that's, that's one of the forms taken by disability-based discrimination viewing people or some aspect of a person's mind or body as deficient and inferior and something that's that's negative in itself rather than as the social model requires understanding that um everyone's you know everyone has a right to their physical and mental integrity and that's how we framed article 17 getting a little ahead of myself the physical and mental integrity of a person notwithstanding any impairments they may have notwithstanding any any impairments that anybody thinks they may have it's your body it's your physical and mental integrity and it's value. It's valuable. Your your human body, your human mind, is of equal worth and dignity as anyone else's. So that's getting getting a little ahead into um, Article Seventeen. Um, and some of these other elements, obtaining information or confession. Sometimes we have said forced psychiatric interventions. And, and similar forced interventions in religious contexts, for instance, could be aimed at getting the person to, to confess that they're mentally ill, getting the person to confess there's something wrong with them, they have demons inside them, they really are all these negative things that the perpetrator thinks they are. We know that, that forced psychiatry is often used as punishment and to intimidate or coerce people, not only that the act itself is coercive, often, you know, in, in this case, the coercive act is also, is, it, it's a violent coercion, but it's also a coercion, it's an instrumental coercion, both to change the person's behavior, 
or communication or and or and also to to intimidate or coerce the person into accepting these interventions as treatment and not bothering with coercion but just going over just accepting similar to the idea of confession okay i'm going to just take these drugs i'll believe that i have a chemical imbalance that there's something wrong with me and even though in my heart of hearts i know that this is not what i want or um i you know that i may convince myself that that this is necessary so i'll just say that in my view the criteria for whether something is forced is exactly whether there is exactly the same as whether or not there's free and informed consent so if a person is is taking a neuroleptic drug by mouth or consenting to electroshock when they when they don't actually want to when they're only doing it because otherwise they know that they will be injected or strapped down and and have some extra physical force used to do it to them that is still a forced intervention it's a forced for it's still what i would consider forced drugging or forced electroshock okay and going on to the next element of the definition when such pain or suffering is inflicted by or at the instigation of or with the consent or act we essence of a public official or other person acting in an official capacity sometimes the the personnel doing the forced drugging or forced electroshock are employees of public institutions and so they would be public officials but it's always with the acquiescence of public officials when it is done pursuant to the country's law when the when the country has enacted a mental health law that that legitimizes and authorizes psychiatrists and other personnel and in institutions to carry out forced drugging or forced electroshock and immunize legal give legal immunity to these individuals for for these acts of violence against another person's body that would be that would be um a, 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 an equivalent to acquiescence beyond that there's also an obligation in international human rights law on government to to take action against acts of violence and harm committed by private persons against each other so for instance with respect to rape if a if a state does not criminalize rape or fails to prosecute acts of rape they would be deficient even though they would be deficient in their obligation under the convention against torture even though it's not necessarily being carried out by public officials the state still has obligations under this standard to prevent such acts that satisfy the definition of torture from being committed by private parties they don't have they don't necessarily have they don't have the obligation to um in respect of each act that's committed that way but the, they have the obligation to at least not facilitate it through their laws to you know to ensure that their legal frameworks are actually set up to criminalize and prosecute such such acts of of torture of violence and th that amount to torture the last element it does not include pain or suffering arising only from inherent in or incidental to lawful sanctions that's usually considered a little bit circular but it's usually considered a way of saying that 
simply putting someone in prison for as 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 a sentence when they're convicted of a crime even though that may cause serious pain and suffering to the individual and it's in intentionally inflicted on them as a punishment that's considered a kind of lawful sanction but there's no sense in which forced psychiatric interventions could be considered lawful sanctions it's not it's not a legitimate act of punishment and yeah i mean i i th i think that that that, that def the definition there is pretty circular because it's what is it what is um a lawful sanction can a lawful sanction be something that does this and i think we can we we can generally understand it as as saying that even though a prison sentence and similar kinds of sanctions that are generally carried out in the criminal justice system are may may give rise to to pain and suffering those th there's some there's some leeway for the government to act to, to, to legitimately do that without falling afoul of the Convention Against Torture. Okay, there's um, just a couple of other references. See also International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 7, and General Comment 20 in relation um, to an understanding of torture and other ill treatment. Also, it's worth knowing the Inter-American Convention <clears throat> to Prevent and Punish Torture recites a very similar definition as the Convention Against Torture Article 1 that I just went over, and also, and goes on to say, torture shall also be understood to be the use of methods upon a person intended to obliterate the personality of the victim or to diminish his physical or mental capacities, even if they do not cause physical pain or mental anguish. An article that I read by Andrew Byrne on, on um, the subject of, of torture described um, or analyzed or um, I, from, from the documentation of the the of this the development of this convention explained that this was intended to this was intended to capture the fact that 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 administration of drugs or similar chemical substances the administration of mind altering substances against a person's will would be considered torture, that it was considered that this might not necessarily cause the person to subjectively experience physical pain or mental anguish. It might, but it might not. At least when they drafted this convention, they, they were of the mind that it, that it might not. You might, be not. you might be unaware that it's being done to you, and, and it might, you, know, you might not experience very dramatic effect. Nevertheless, these methods would, because they're intended to obliterate the personality or diminish the person's physical or mental capacities, they would also be considered to be torture. So that's another, another angle from which to understand that forced psychiatric interventions partake of that and and can be understood to be torture in that sense as well. I don't, I think that I have the reference to that article by Andrew Byrne in my 2007 paper uh, that, that I have linked on the, the course materials, my paper that's titled the UN Convention on the Right to Persons with Disabilities and the Right to be Free from Forced Psychiatric Interventions. And Andrew Byrne also explains that even though this, this um, piece of a definition is not included in the Convention Against Torture, 
it should be fit back in to the understanding of how we interpret the Convention Against Torture to, to, to understand this kind of diminishment of physical and mental capacities or the intent to do so as a, a, a way of inflicting severe physical or mental pain or suffering. So the first UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, P. Koigman, in 1986, this was the first report issued by a UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, included a list of methods of physical torture that listed, and this also is a direct quote, it listed, among other things, Electric shocks, shocks of variable intensity to any part of the body causing intensive muscular contractions. So I, I don't know if they were thinking about electric shocks to the brain, but, but we certainly know that that, um, you know, the electric shocks to the brain would be, would be included in this that, and, and beyond causing intensive muscular contractions also cause brain damage by the, by the electricity going through the brain. And he also included here as a method of physical torture, administration of drugs in detention or psychiatric facilities. And he listed a few different types of drugs, among which was neuroleptics that cause trembling, shivering, and contractions, but mainly make the subject apathetic and dull his or her intelligence. That was the description of neuroleptics that was given by a special rapporteur on torture. And I, I, I would wonder if he was thinking of all of the people in psychiatric institutions and detention, the ordinary people who are put there because psychiatrists want them there or because they may have been convicted of a crime but or if he's thinking if he's responding particularly to the use of psychiatry and and psychiatric drugs against people who who are political opponents of the state i think it's interesting that it's a definite a, a a reference to the administration of neuroleptic drugs that has no reference to the idea that this might be some kind of beneficial treatment for any person it's purely a reference that describes the effects on a person and characterizes it as a kind of physical torture and I would say from my own experience and from experiences described by many survivors, the fact that someone has said that this is a good thing for us, that it's going to be a treatment, does not mean that we experience it any differently than what was described here in this report in 1986 by the torture rapporteur. We don't you know, it doesn't, as one uh, writer said, who is a, a, a doctor of social work and has done meta-analyses of studies about neuroleptic drugs, his name is David Cohen, he has said there's no difference between how neuroleptic drugs affect a schizophrenic and how they affect a hippopotamus or, you know, obviously, or any other human being or any other animal, it's, it has a very strong effect. It's been characterized as a chemical straitjacket or chemical lobotomy. And I think what we have to really question or wonder about is why such drugs ever would even be used consensually, why people would sometimes agree to take these drugs, which some people do, mostly as far as I understand when people are using neuroleptic drugs with 
true free and informed consent when it's something the person actually wants to do. It might be to, to diminish distress caused, caused by hearing voices or some other extreme distress that this type of um, substance act, will have an effect that the person feels is beneficial. It's usually in very low dosages and it's something that that has to be very very carefully and cautiously considered i think that in in general the history of the use of these drugs in psychiatry has been in contexts where people didn't have any inkling of any right to free and informed consent and and where it's been developed more as in the nature of controlling individuals, controlling institutional populations, making them more manageable and, and punishing and just showing people that someone else has power over them. So this is the, the WNUSP text proposal, how we framed the, the question um, because all of the things that I'm saying, how would you put it succinctly in a proposal when you, when you are in the course of developing a human rights treaty and you want people to understand what you're talking about and you want something to be framed that could, could be, could show the nature of the human rights violation and point to what the remedy is. Well, we, we made this text proposal and it was accepted into the working group text, which was the, an, an early version of the CRPD text. Eventually it was dropped, our language was dropped, and the question of forced interventions as torture was not included in the convention per se, but the language on prohibition of torture on an equal basis is, is obviously still there in Article 15. And we have, through the, the, the right to legal capacity and the right to exercise free and informed consent in healthcare, we have the prohibition of forced interventions, which I, I think I have that specifically later on, and, and many of you are already are very familiar with that. But let's just read this the text proposal here now. It said, everyone has the right not to be subjected to forced or coerced interventions of a medical nature or otherwise aimed at correcting, improving, or alleviating any actual or perceived impairment. So <laughs> this, this has the various different elements in it. The right not to be subjected to forced or coerced interventions. So we're talking about um, anything that is not with the person's own free and informed consent. And you see here the force and coercion are equivalent. And it's interventions of a medical nature or otherwise, because we were aware and still are of some of the violations in places like prayer camps and, you know, it could be in, in any place really that someone believes that there's something wrong with the person because of an impairment, actual or perceived, and they, they think there's some kind of intervention that, that has to be done, but, and they're irrespective of whether the person agrees with it. So it's objectifying the person, it's objectifying um, the idea of their, their impairment and, um, and, and, and dehumanizing the person, reducing the person to, to this idea that there's something wrong with them that, 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 that someone else perceives and, and has some uh, 
right or authority to actually try to change against the person's will. Uh, so we see medical nature or otherwise, and it's aimed at correcting, improving, or alleviating an impairment. So it's specifically these interventions that are, that are like I was saying, objectifying the, the person, objectifying something about them that is different, that may be different than other people, and that is viewed in some kind of a negative light. And saying that we have to, we have to fix this. That is a very um, common, at least, attitude towards people with disabilities, towards people with many different kinds of impairments. And we frame this generally not only with reference to psychiatry and to actual or perceived mental health conditions or psychosocial disability, but in fact we, we learned that there were people with physical impairments who had been subjected to, to surgeries without their free and informed consent. And it, 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 it was a very powerful experience in the process of the drafting and negotiation of the convention to, to experience the solidarity of the disability community on this issue where, where there was a commonality and everyone or many people, especially people with disabilities themselves who were part of the International Disability Caucus and also those on government delegations could very easily see how this is a violation. And it was coming from our experience as people who experience or have been treated as if we experience um, some alterations in consciousness or or distress that get called a mental health issue, but it also was a way of bringing forward some, some other similar kinds of violations that other people with disabilities, other, of, of other um, sectors or groups of people with disabilities also experience. <coughs> So as I said, it was picked up in the, the working group text. And although it was eventually dropped from the text of the convention, it was actually picked up in three articles of the working group text, the articles on torture and ill treatment, on violence, freedom from violence, exploitation, and abuse, and also the article on, on um, health. So the, the original numbering was different from what it came to be in the, in the adopted convention. And, but, but it was eventually, that particular language was dropped and the, the, the prohibition of forced interventions, as I said, came in from the right to legal capacity and the right to, to, um, to free and informed consent in healthcare. Later, the special rapporteur on torture, Manfred Novak, picked up that language from from WNUSP, and he 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 um he he adapted it a little bit differently. He left out. He made it focused on medical treatment rather than medical na of a medical nature or otherwise, and he made some other adjustments in his version. It was saying that, that uh, no, I'm not going to even get it right. I don't even, let's see if I have it there. No, in his version, it was um, about medical treatment that is enforced or administered without the free and informed consent of the person concerned. Okay, that a medical treatment aimed at correcting or alleviating an actual or perceived disability 
may constitute torture or other ill treatment if it is enforced or administered without the free and informed consent of the person concerned. So he changed the wording somewhat, but but it has that same concept. And that was the report by Special Rapporteur on Torture Manfred Novak um, from July 2008. And I have a link here. I'm not going to go to that link now, but you can you can access that document when if from this from these slides when you're looking at the slides by yourself and it's also on the the course materials page for this segment <coughs> okay survivorship and reparation i think as i was saying somewhat before survivors confront the damage with whatever resources we have whether that is self-care, anger, grief, writing, art, caring for land or animals or children, and the survivor movement itself, getting together with other people who have had this ex these experiences or similar experiences, reading what other survivors have said. I know for me, soon after I soon after I became involved in the survivor movement, very soon after um, my experience of having been locked up and forced in psychiatry. And I remember reading an article in the publication Madness Network News that existed at that time in the late 70s. Um, yeah, I would say it was probably the late 70s that talked about forced drugging and, and all of these other things that happened to us as a form of state repression, as, 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 as um, the state, the, the full power of the state coming down on us with violence against our bodies. And that, did, that was one of the things that, um, that I resonated with that, you know, connecting with what other people are saying about it made space for me to understand and, and relate to um, what had actually happened to me. I'll say about art, many, many survivors are, have, have been dealing with some of these issues in their art. And we, we have on the Absolute Prohibition website, absoluteprohibition.org, there's a new page that's gone up with some more um, very amazing artwork by survivors about th these experiences. How can society support us? I think very, it starts with a recognition that our human rights were violated by forced interventions. I think it's it's a whole constellation of violations. It's the forced drugging, it's deprivation of the right to make decisions, which is a, a deprivation of legal capacity, a deprivation of physical liberty, which puts us in a place where other people have power and control over us and not only not only um all the different aspects where that's dehumanizing but the fact that putting us in a place of deprivation of liberty facilitates their power to exercise these forced interventions on our bodies, um, whether it's by direct additional force or by coercing us through threats into complying with this violence ourselves. It's important for society to recognize and take in what these what these experiences have been in our lives to throw off the lens of treatment 
to throw off the idea that this is some kind of therapeutic treatment and take in what it what it actually means as we are describing it i think one it's it's helpful to think about the the forced psychiatry as torture in new because it takes us out of that question of you know can this is what is this the right way to treat mental illness? Is this the right way or the wrong way to respond to people experiencing very deep distress or altered states of consciousness? Instead, what that's, that's an, that, those are some other questions that we need to, to deal with from a human rights perspective. But framing the issue as torture allows us to center what is this experience and what does it actually look like when the perpetrator's justifications for it are not providing the you know the overall framing through which we see it so i think that the 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 characterization of neuroleptics by the Special Rapporteur on Torture in 1986 helps with that. There, there are also books by Peter Bregan, who's a psychiatrist who was, who has been a very strong opponent of forced drugging and of psychiatric drugs, uh, at least the, the use of psychiatric drugs generally. Two of his books, a 1983 book that I think is out of print now, and also a, a more recent book, I think from 2010, describe in neutral terms what neuroleptics and other psychiatric drugs do to the body. And I recall the 1983 book mentioning as the signature effects of psychiatric drugs um, psychic apathy and indifference, which we saw the, the special rapporteur on torture in 1986 also included, and akathisia. Akathisia is, it's, it's something that might be different for different people, and I would describe it as an experience of both physical and psychic turmoil that's extremely distressing that akathisia in itself um that as an effect would probably qualify as torture it's the effect that makes a lot of people pace up and down the halls and there's related effects um on people's movement and um and muscles there's a lot that that you can can read about some of these physical effects um, much okay. Yeah, I was I was describing when I read Peter Bregan's characterization of neuroleptics in neutral terms. He's not looking at you know is it a good treatment or a bad treatment for mental illness. He's just saying what do these drugs do to people, and. I understood something about what had actually been done to me, including the psychic apathy and indifference piece, which is actually something that you might not necessarily be aware of, um, kind of along the lines of the way the Inter-American Convention was acknowledging that um, sometimes there can be an act of torture that is diminishing and intended to diminish your physical and mental capacities or annihilate your personality, that it may you may not be aware of the effects that it's actually causing you. So that is all part of my point that society needs to recognize that our human rights were violated and
they need to at least hear and take in our perspective on it and not frame their understanding of what's going on with a preconceived agenda of mental health treatment and whether this is a good or bad mental health treatment, but look at from the perspective of the people who are saying that we're victims and survivors, what this actually looks like. And from these other sources, what is a neutral objective free of any you know agenda description of these um of these acts and their effects and you could say well okay it's not free of an agenda the torture rapporteur was you know is is aiming to to characterize the violations so he's going to focus on the negatives and peter bregan also um is someone who sees psychiatric drugs as having strongly negative effects. But I think that if you look at these things in context, um, these are agendas that emerge from the experience rather than being imposed on it by others. These are, these are um, agendas to stop the violence and there's no preconceived idea that um, it's, it has to be viewed as negative. It's rather that um, the agenda to stop the violence emerges from an understanding and empathy and appreciation that it's, it's very um, harmful and destructive um, violent experiences and, or violent acts. So reparation, um, hum let me see if I can actually go to, maybe it's, let's see if it will take me to that page, yeah. So the United Nations in 2005 adopted basic principles and guidelines on the right to a remedy and, and reparation for victims of gross violations of international human rights law and serious violations of international humanitarian law. <laughs> I, would, I would encourage you to, to read this or at least, you know, read, read parts of it. In fact, when it was adopted, it wasn't so clear what would be considered gross violations of international human rights law, but the obligation to provide remedy and reparations is being taken up in a number of places. It was taken up by the Committee on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women for Acts of Discrimination Against Women. Um, it was certainly taken up by the Torture Committee for Acts of Torture and Other Ill Treatment, it was taken up by the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention as, as an obligation um, to provide reparation to people who have been arbitrarily detained, and it has been taken up by the CRPD Committee, um, certainly with respect to arbitrary detention, and mm, I believe some other things as well. Some of you may, may actually know that better than me right now. Um, but I think it's clear that this obligation to provide remedy and reparations is, is essentially something that, that uh, there's going to be a great number of of different kinds of human rights violations that it 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 relates to, and it's very clear, I think, that it does relate to forced psychiatric interventions, which we're describing as, I think, one conservative way of saying it is a form of torture or other ill treatment or a form of ill treatment that arguably amounts to torture, or simply to say it's a form of torture if we accept 
the argument um, the argument that I have been making that the 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 criteria in in Convention Against Torture Article One apply. Also, of course, the um, the deprivation of liberty in psychiatric hospitals or institutions is a form of arbitrary detention, and we'll get to that in a later segment. So here, the different forms of reparation, first, there's an obligation to provide a remedy, to provide access to justice for people whose rights have been violated by, um, by these serious violations. Also, reparations. People sometimes think that reparation means compensation, means a money payment. And in some cases, that might be the most important form of reparation that, that a victim needs. But there are also other forms. Restitution should, whenever possible, I'm reading from this, restore the victim to the original situation before the gross violations occurred. Restitution includes as appropriate restoration of liberty, enjoyment of human rights, identity, family life and citizenship, return to one's place of residence, restoration of employment and return of property. So, you know, we can certainly see um, people who are currently institutionalized, obviously, or, or involuntarily hospitalized, involuntarily detained in psychiatry, have a right immediately to have their liberty restored. Certainly that's kind of a precondition of anything else. They should, can, can you return them to their place of residence or have they irrevocably lost their home? Um, can they be restored to their employment? Can they have their property returned to them that may have been taken or somehow lost um, or um, destroyed in the process of this happening. Compensation um, for economically accessible damage and um, includes compensation for physical and mental harm, lost opportunities, material damages and loss of earnings, moral damage and costs required for legal or expert assistance, medicine and medical services, psychological and social services. In the case of forced psychiatry, we should also think about, um, in, in both in compensation and in the next category, rehabilitation, supporting the person, pr providing economic assistance and, and direct services for them to be able to withdraw from psychiatric drugs that once the person has been on them for a period of time, the body can become habituated and the person can get withdrawal um, symptoms. So there may be a need for actual assistance in withdrawing from these drugs. Um, also in dealing with the effects of, of drugs that may persist afterwards, such as tardive dyskinesia, whatever effects a person may have from electroshock that has been forced on them or done to them without free and informed consent. And I'll just say also, I'm focusing on free and informed consent here as the criteria for characterizing forced psychiatric interventions as torture. I think it can be possible to look at under what other circumstances, even if a person has consented, any of these practices might still amount to an act of torture, ill treatment, or other ill treatment. Um, certainly, certain kinds of electroshock, electroshock that is done to the person without anesthesia, has already been characterized as a form of torture or other ill treatment. Um, of course, that only deals with the, the immediate suffering inflicted by the fact that you're aware that this is being done to you and you experience the, the muscle contractions consciously. Um, 
it doesn't deal at all with the actual brain damage effects of the electroshock itself or damage that might be caused by the the muscle contractions notwithstanding um you know as 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 a not in the immediate suffering but as a consequence um so i'm i'm just going to to flag that or bracket it there's certainly room to explore what it would mean um and under what circumstances should any of these very severe or very um intrusive or invasive kinds of treatments be characterized simply as as ill treatment or torture um that should never ever be done or offered to a person that's i think something that still needs to be explored and certainly there are the need to provide say withdrawal services and services for people um to deal with the consequences would also apply to people who you know who 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 have undergone the treatments voluntarily as well but certainly here when we're talking about people who did not have the opportunity to to give informed consent who who were misinformed who said no and you know it was done to them against their will certainly it's an obligation in this context of reparations for serious or gross human rights violations rehabilitation should include medical and psychological care as well as legal and social services and as i was saying it should include in this context um assistance to withdraw of course all of these things any any services need to be uh not imposed or coerced or forced on the person um that would be a repetition of the violation we're talking about services being offered based on free and informed consent of the person concerned and especially in the context where where we're talking about forced psychiatric interventions as a violation um don't uh, i i i would advise don't assume that people are going to want psychological care or the services of a psychiatrist um there would be a need to be very sensitive to um people's experiences to 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 try and find out what exactly is is going to be the most helpful to the person maybe some some person may want to to see a sensitive psychiatrist or a psychologist who can help them deal with the trauma and others will simply want to stay far away from anything of the mental health system at all okay satisfaction should include effective measures aimed at the cessation of continuing violations <clears throat> verification of the facts full and public disclosure of the truth to the extent that disclosure does not harm the victim or other people or the victim's relatives etc um search for the whereabouts of the disappeared official declaration or judicial decision restoring the dignity reputation and rights public apology judicial and administrative sanctions against the persons liable for the violations commemorations and tributes to victims accurate account of the violations in human rights law training and educational material material at all levels i think these kind of elements under satisfaction are the elements that i think are the most interesting to explore if it's possible in any country at any point to actually um have the state recognize look we know we've done we've done a great deal of harm to people we're going to 
to really make a shift in our policy. We're going to really look at um, pe how people with psychosocial disabilities have been mistreated and discriminated against systematically, um, in, in particular through these forced psychiatric interventions and everything related to them. And, and, and we're going to make an apology and we're going to, to make sure that um, we're res we have restored everyone's rights. We've taken effective measures to make sure that everybody can get out of these institutions and, um, you know, that, that anyone in the mental health system who is continuing to perpetrate forced treatment is, you know, is immediately sanctioned. Just those are the kinds of things we can imagine. And, um, there's always a question of political will, but I think it can be useful for us to think about, to use this kind of, to use this reparations framework as a way of thinking about what are the steps that need to be taken to end the violations and to address the consequences and the harm done by the violations in society and for the individual victims and for people with psychosocial disabilities as a victimized group in society. So guarantees of non-repetition, it includes many things, but in the one that I have focused on is reviewing and reforming laws contributing to or allowing gross violations of international human rights law. I mean, I think that 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 in many ways is is one of the one of the first things that we've obviously been promoting. And we can think about some of these obligations. They may be characterized as a form of reparations. They are also some of the the obligations that emanate from the CRPD and or and and possibly other human rights treaties that sometimes i think i think it's obvious that that states may resist the idea okay i'm i have I, we we've done these very serious human rights violations we have to make a systematic program of reparation, but some of the obligations are simply obligations that they have as a result of international law, um, you know, say the CRPD that they have ratified and that is binding on them, reviewing and reforming the laws and, um, effective measures aimed at the cessation of violations, those are obligations that they have under the CRPD, uh, even if, even if they don't, even if they aren't thinking in terms of a full framework of reparation. So I think it can help us to understand that these, all of the measures that we're trying to have states implement can also be seen as aspects of the obligation to, um, to provide remedy and reparation for gross human rights violations. And at the same time, the states do not have to accept wholesale the reparations framework or its applicability to forced psychiatric interventions in order to carry out these obligations. <laughs> okay. Um, CRPD, Articles 15, 16, and 17 generally protect the right to be free from torture, ill treatment, other violence, and abuse. Article 14 protects the equal right to liberty and security of the person and prohibits disability-based detention. 
Article 12 guarantees legal capacity, which is the right to make one's own decisions. Article 25 requires that health care is provided on the basis of free and informed consent. Um, I think we went, we looked at last time the, the articles of the CRPD, and I think um, many of you may be familiar with them, but I will, at this point, I think I will just invite you to, to, to make sure you take a look at these articles. This is 15, 16, and 17. 17 is very simple. Every person with disabilities has a right to respect for his and or her physical and mental integrity on an equal basis with others. 16 is um, generally on freedom from exploitation, violence, and abuse, specifying both within and outside the home and including gender-based aspects. So the way that Article 16, um, the kinds of things that are said about exploitation, violence, and abuse, and the kinds of obligations seem to be um, the kinds of abuses that may be occurring in families and, and also in institutions, um, but that might not necessarily be might not necessarily be the the acts of medical violence um, and might not necessarily be what is considered to amount to torture or other ill treatment. The CRPD committee has <coughs> has usually addressed forced psychiatric in interventions under either article fifteen or article seventeen um I don't think there's any instance I can think of when they were addressing it under Article 16 alone, although in general comment number one, they they deal with Articles 15, 16, and 17 together, saying that um, forced psychiatric interventions, forced, forced treatment of any kind, including in the psychiatric context, violates the right to legal capacity and also infringes the right to be free from torture and other ill treatment and, and these other obligations under Articles 16 and 17. So here, uh, Article 12, we'll be discussing more in detail next time on legal capacity, and Article 14, we'll be discussing um, in the segment after that, the right to liberty and security of the person. I'll show briefly the provision in Article 25 on health. It's in paragraph D that states parties shall, it's a very, um, it's a funny sentence. States parties shall require health professionals to provide care of the same quality to persons with disabilities as to others, including on the basis of free and informed consent by inter alia, raising awareness of the human rights, et cetera. Um, the, the way that that sentence is drafted, you know, what's important for us is that it does include um, the obligation to provide care on the basis of free and informed consent to the same extent for persons with disabilities as that obligation applies to others. And in human rights law, generally, and the way that the CRPD committee interprets um, Article 25 and also Articles 12 and 14 um, and 15 and 17, this is this is a a pretty un, this is an unequivocal right that there is a right to to have to be provided um, with health care, including mental health services on the basis of free and informed consent of the person concerned. And there really is no justification for a state to say, you know, we don't provide this for anybody. Um, it's, 
it's um, you know the, the, it's it's an aspect of the the right to physical and mental integrity and the right to legal capacity to make these decisions for ourselves about health care, including mental health care. Now, I will say, I don't know if I link this in the court in the course materials. There's a general comment, uh, general comment. I believe it's number 14 uh, by the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. It's, it's, it's either general comment 14 on Article 12 of their convention or uh, general comment number 12 on Article 14. I forget which, but it, but it won't be hard to find. And they do allow for some limited exceptions where some coercive measures can be taken in healthcare. Now, the, what they specifically give as examples, number one is mental health care, which under the CRPD, that's simply not allowed because the only basis to single out mental health care for coercive treatment is either simply discrimination against people with psychosocial disabilities or um, discrimination based on either discrimination in the sense that it's seen as if this is somehow a different kind of care that, that regular standards aren't applicable to and the fact that it's a specific kind of care or service that's provided <clears throat> to a subgroup of people with disabilities, that's discrimination. Or if it's viewed as an aspect of legal capacity that people um, in people um, who it, the people who are um, thought to be needing mental health care, are also treated as lacking legal capacity, lacking the right, not, not, not needing to have their right to legal capacity respected, not, not needing, not meriting or not um, having the right to have their decisions respected. Those are all forms of discrimination. So that is taken out. The other kinds of examples they give are all about public health situations like quarantine in the case of certain illnesses that are airborne that you cannot prevent by universal precautions otherwise which as you know we have universal precautions in place in relation to HIV AIDS and so although quarantine was suggested in by by certain people in the early stages of the AIDS epidemic, it was rejected because, in fact, um, there are there are measures that can be done short of that. So it's a very extreme measure, um, and the the rationale that is used for quarantine simply does not apply in the case of mental health because mental health. The aim of coercion, there's nothing about my mental health that will endanger your life directly. Um, my mental health is, is my internal experience. If I, if I use that framework for how I understand any kind of distress that I'm experiencing, the thing that, um, coercion is typically addressed to is the is is my actions that people some someone may believe are caused by my mental health condition but the, the actions if i am acting aggressively against another person to harm them it's the, the 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 proper way to address that is through the criminal justice system or law enforcement through laws that are equally applicable to everyone and not by um trying to intervene in my 
in my consciousness or my body. And, and I think specifically that, that um, part of the definition from the Inter-American Convention is applicable here as to why intervention against my mind and body is not an appropriate way to, um, to stop me from harming another person if I'm, if I'm making that kind of threat or attempt because it's something, it's a very drastic measure that is intended to and does diminish my physical and mental capacities. Um, it's similar in that way to, to types of punishments that have been condemned as a form of torture ill treatment, such as amputating a person's hand. Um, when we're talking about actually changing the person's mind or body against their will, th that's not an appropriate or legitimate way to protect the public safety. So there's other things that could be said on that, but um, stop there for now. Novak's report in 2008, the Special Rapporteur on Torture, paragraph 44, has um, a, a very succinct and good description of how some of these articles of the CRPD, um, what they mean in terms of, um, as Professor Novak characterized it, the, uh, the, the, well, that, that the CRPD, unlike earlier standards such as the principles for the protection of persons with mental illness does not accept the practices of involuntary commitment and involuntary treatment. And the fact that he said that very clearly um, in his 2008 report was, was one of the early interpretations of the CRPD that affirmed the, the, the aims and the advocacy of people with psychosocial disabilities that these provisions of the CRPD had to be understood as prohibiting um, forced and coerced mental health interventions, including the, the detention. Okay, so I, I would encourage you to read and familiarize yourselves with some of these materials as well. Professor Novak's report in 2008 is, is very good on um, laying out some of the underlying reasoning. He, he views CRPD as complementary to the anti-torture framework, applies disability non-discrimination um, in some very um, significant and useful ways, some of which, um, I would say many of which we had also advocated for. Uh, Juan Mendez in 2013, in some respects, he took Novak's work further. He, this, this report urged states to impose an absolute ban on forced, uh, essentially on forced psychiatric interventions, including um, forced medication or forced drugging, forced electroshock, torture, uh, uh, restraint and seclusion. But he, he had some, the report had some internal contradictions on the question of liberty, where in some places it was um, upholding the CRPD standard of prohibiting deprivation of liberty based on disability. And in, in one other paragraph, um, it, it's actually contradicting that standard. Then uh, he also had an exchange of letters with the World Psychiatric Association <coughs> where he appears to disavow the absolute ban, even though that appeared to be very clear. And there's some I, there's that that exchange with um, the World Psychiatric Association is contained in a compilation of materials written by various people 
um, in response to that report in 2013, I have a, 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 an article or a paper in that compilation, and, and mine was addressed to um, how the way that I was, that, that I would, was interpreting um, <clears throat> his, his report and, and responding to it in light of the CRPD obligations. CRPD committee in the, the general comment on Article 12 in 2014 and then their guidelines on Article 14, 2015, except that forced psychiatric interventions violate the right to legal capacity um, and violate also the right to be free from torture and other ill treatment. The terminology of uh, went from saying that uh, these interventions or forced treatment infringe the right to be free from torture and other ill treatment in the general comment number one, and then in the guidelines on Article 14, forced treatment is simply included along with a number of other violations as one of the practices that violates Article 15. So, so I would say that under the CRPD at this point, um, under the guidelines on Article 14, it does appear that it's accepted that forced treatment violates the prohibition on torture and ill treatment, that it at least amounts to an act of ill treatment. Um, and uh, as I've been arguing, I would say that it, it does meet the criteria for torture, but the CRPD committee has not addressed that aspect yet. Obstacles and opportunities. The Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture, which is a human rights monitoring mechanism that oversees the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture, conflicts with the CRPD standards. <laughs> they, um, they have said that they have advanced the position in, I believe, it became a general comment of theirs that um, the right to health and the right to be free from torture and other ill treatment actually require forced treatment. Of course, you know, I disagree with that. The CRPD committee disagrees with that. Um, I don't seem to have linked that document here, but I will try to share it with you if I, if I haven't done so elsewhere. The Committee Against Torture and the Human Rights Committee, which monitors the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, have not um, upheld what I have referred to as the CRPD absolute prohibition against um, forced psychiatric interventions, as well as the absolute prohibition against psychiatric detention. Um, so you do have this conflict among human rights mechanisms that it's important to be aware of. And as one of my colleagues, Hege Orofelen, has, has said many times, this conflict does not excuse any of the state's parties to the CRPD from upholding all of their obligations under the CRPD. I know there's over 170 state's parties at this point and they are obligated to fully uphold the absolute prohibition because that's the standard of this treaty that they have um, accepted as legally binding. The Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, I've linked to a document um, that, that we had some input into and largely follows the CRPD standards. When I wrote these slides in the spring, it was not clear what their practice would be. However, it's really good news to know that the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, along with the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, um, has issued a very well done urgent appeal in a case of forced psychiatry from Norway that that demonstrates 
a, a willingness to uphold the CRPD standard of absolute prohibition of these practices. And um, that also I will try to share links. The Some of these other human rights mechanisms are positive towards the CRPD standard, the Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the CEDAW Committee, Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, um, Committee on the Rights of the Child, Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. They, they all need some more work. Um, and so if, if your state has ratified, if your, if your country has ratified these other treaties, um, and and it's useful in your advocacy. You may want to to bring them more information that relates to their specific mandates, both to educate them and also for the value that can be gained from building up, concluding observations and recommendations to your country from a number of different treaty bodies. My friend Hege Orafelen has been doing that um, in Norway, that's part of the advocacy strategy being used there um, against um, forced psychiatry to abolish forced psychiatric interventions. OPCAT monitoring, uh, I know this the, this may is, is quite a lot of information, especially for people who, who may be very new to the human rights framework. Um, but under the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture, countries are obligated to establish national torture prevention mechanisms. If a country has ratified that treaty, they will be establishing a national torture prevention mechanism that will have the obligation of visiting places of detention and monitoring to prevent torture and ill treatment. Now, the SPT, the the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture, as we as as I said, conflicts with the CRPD standards. So, if your country has set up such a national torture prevention mechanism, will they follow the CRPD or will they follow the opposite standard that is um, that is saying forced treatment is necessary? I think. Um, if your country is 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 involved in that discussion, if your country has set up a prevention mechanism, it's worthwhile to to connect with them and to do some advocacy. Again, my my friend and colleague Hega in Norway <clears throat> has has done that with with some positive results. I believe I'm not uh, I'm not entirely certain, and I'm not certain how um, what the status of it is right now but it's 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 important to to consider that it's not simply um it's it it's something worth pursuing and don't don't just um think that it's that they will simply have to follow the SPT there's 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 room for advocacy there there are <clears throat> some NGOs can be potential allies, but but be careful. Equal Rights Trust is is actually Equal Rights Trust put out a really good report earlier this year on um, on forms of torture that are based on discrimination, among which they included uh, forced psychiatric interventions, as well as certain practices um, of detention, protective detention of women in the countries they were looking at. You, I, I encourage you to follow that link and, um, and see what, what they're doing. Association for Prevention of Torture and Human Rights Watch, I would say, are both organizations that are looking at these issues, but that have not necessarily and, and, and often have not really upheld the full extent of the CRPD standard of absolute prohibition. And that can certainly be problematic if they're making recommendations in relation to a country and they are 
only recommending, say, a reduction in the use of coercive mental health practices instead of, in fact, the prohibition and absolute cessation of these acts that amount to uh, torture or at least some form of ill treatment. So you can look at these NGOs and similar NGOs as potential allies, and yet if you are a user or a survivor of psychiatry, a person with psychosocial disability, understand that you need to stay centered in your own authority and your power as a person who's impacted by these violations, as an organization of people impacted by these violations. And, um, you know, you, you need to be able to say, look, um, you know, this is not, this is not really the way that our experience and and our justice needs actually um, require, and 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 furthermore, this is not actually what the CRPD requires if they're if they're not following the correct standard. CRPD country reviews, um, very important to to get involved with shadow reporting if your country has ratified the CRPD. We'll talk more about that in in later segments of the course. And also optional, if your country has ratified the optional protocol, to, to, to promote awareness of the, the availability of the optional protocol um, to, as, as a further avenue to address cases of forced treatment when the, when, when the country's own courts or other justice mechanisms have, have not provided the justice that you're seeking. There are some cases pending on forced treatment in front of the CRPD committee. I don't know if any of them have now been decided. I know the committee just finished another session, so I will be checking on that. Um, reparations, I think we went over that, and I guess that that is um, the end. Let me just see if there was anything. Yeah, I think we went over the reparations enough. So I'm okay. I don't see anything there. I would like to invite um, if if anybody has questions, if you would like to type questions in a chat, or if you find it easier to to speak than to write in the chat, and you would like to ask a question, just type in the chat that you would like to speak um, and I can unmute you. So if anybody would like to ask any questions or make any comments, and I should have also, I mean, I, I um, generally, I, I mean, or always, I would, I will be welcoming if people have questions or comments as as we go along. I I do have the window open in front of me and can see if you are typing something in the chat window. So I try to check in with that every once in a while. And I'm not seeing any questions or comments. So I hope that this has been informative and and interesting for everyone. Um, and I think I will make sure it, I will simply type this question. Okay. Okay, at least I, th I think you're all hearing me since I see one person has typed something in the chat. And um, regarding assignments, I would just like to say, please don't worry if you, if you didn't get to do the assignment yet for, for the first segment. Um, I know sometimes in the beginning of, of, of a class, it's hard uh, 
to make sure you know what you're supposed to do or where the materials are. Um, I'd like to make it possible for everybody to 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 access all the materials, to do all the assignments to the extent that 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 you want to and the, to the extent you can. So so don't worry about it. You can make up the first one. Um, positive. We have a question about positive examples of free and informed consent for treatment. Um, I'm not actually sure what you mean in terms of positive examples, but I did, I gave a presentation on free and informed consent last January at the, the University of Galway, uh, NUI Galway, as part of a project, a project they have going on on legal capacity. And there's, there's the slides and video available of that. You know, I think there's, there's in, in the mental health context, and maybe generally, the concept of free and informed consent, you know, has actually been a double edge, has been double edged in that in some ways, in some context, it's a protection of the human rights of the person using health care, but it has also been used against us when it becomes, when, when the idea of legal capacity or mental capacity as a reason to deprive legal capacity gets incorporated in the concept of free and informed consent, that's one of the problems that has happened. So <clears throat> sometimes the concept of free and informed consent as it's, as it's incorporated into national law might include a requirement that the person is capable of understanding and appreciating the nature of the treatment and the risks and benefits. And that of course can be used against people who, you know, who, who express themselves in, in non-normative ways or who, um, simply don't agree with the way that mental health professionals conceptualize the treatments and 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 especially in a context where there's coercive circumstances where coercion is always a possibility also free and with free and informed consent um it's sometimes i know in contexts of physical health care and even what you know, things like alternative health practices like acupuncture in the United States, sometimes you're simply given a paper with very small print and it lists all of the things that have ever gone wrong with the treatment that you are interested in having and you're being asked simply to sign away any rights you have to sue the practitioner um, in case something bad happens to you. And that is, is not necessarily protective of the rights of the person using health care. That, that is informed consent as protection of the medical practitioner, you know, showing the way that health care operates as an exercise of legal capacity, essentially as a kind of contract. But um, I think that in my presentation for Galway, I, 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 I have addressed some of the things that I think would be useful in, um, in looking at what, what is desirable, how free and informed consent should be implemented and I guess I'll, I'd be happy to talk further about that. Um, 
and also if you if you just want to explain any anything more detail what the concerns are that that um regarding what, what kind of positive examples you'd be interested in so and we can we have still have a few minutes we could discuss that now or else later on by email I'll also say in relation that, that the assignment for this segment, the way that I'm generally saying it is that the assignments are due a week after the lecture. And, you know, if possible, that's when I would like to receive your assignments. It makes it easier and helpful for me to be able to deal with people's writing on one topic at a time, and then I'm reading all of them and responding to it. But if you need to hand it in late, it's, it's perfectly fine. And I want to make it as, I want to make it possible, you know, in, in any way that I can by, you know, for, for people to, to complete all of the assignments that they want to, and that they're able to do at any point. So uh, I hope that people can actually find where, if I'll, I will show this for everyone's benefit, for the people um, here listening now, and for everyone, the course content pages, because I don't think I went through all of this last time. The course content, you see the menu, general materials, and then each of the segments. This is segment two on torture, and you see the different readings. There's links to many things, and I do have the SPT there. And then I have the spring 2000, the spring materials, um, the materials from the class in the spring, and then I have the assignment. So the assignment is always going to be at the very end of this, the web page of the course materials. Okay. Um, for the first segment overview, it's essentially the same structure. There's the reading materials. You see, I put asterisk essential materials, and then certain of them are marked with that asterisk. Those are the things I, th I think are the most important for people to read. I've provided a, a large amount of materials because there's a lot of very interesting stuff, and, and I'm encouraging people to read what interests them the most. And then here's the, the assignment um, at the bottom of that web page for topic one, and it goes on for all of them. The general materials page has links to the CRPD and some of the most important materials. I think I probably will put up the new general comment on article 19 that was just put out and a few other important links. And I have a lot here from the negotiation archives. Um, you know, that may or may not be very interesting to people. Uh, I think when I, I, well, for whatever reason, that was what I made when I was, when I was developing this. Um, so I think you can... People who are here now, and and when 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 people are um, looking at this at the recording of this lecture, you can see how it's working on these on these web pages for the reading materials and the assignments. And there's a, a further comment about informed consent, doubts about the existence of real free and informed consent that it is effective to prevent any forced treatment. 
Okay. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that, that's an important thing to look at. I do think that repealing laws that allow forced treatment and that give immunity and impunity to the perpetrators of forced treatment is an important step. I think that can, that's, that's really an important step. Um, I mean, it, it, it may also differ between different countries and customs and traditions in terms of legal traditions and medical traditions, the way people are dealing with situations of going to a doctor or going to a hospital or a psychiatrist or a psychologist. But I think getting rid of the legal permissions at least allows people to come in to come into court and sue and i mean if that's even a useful thing or to use whatever remedies and i think the question you know in free and informed consent the standard is that it it has to be both free and informed so what does that actually mean and i think that that the meaning of that can be developed in ways that are more protective or less protective of the person's human rights. And I would, of course, want it to be developed in the most highly protective way possible. So, so for instance, giving a person incentives to, to freely consent to forced treatment wouldn't be free. Coercive circumstances, um, is it possible even to give free and informed consent when, when there is still a power of, of forced interventions legally? Um, and, and I know there's, there's quite a lot to be, to be looked at, but I think that that aspect is something that has to be developed in practice and then also, of course, through changing practices in the mental health system, in communities, even, you know, I know there are situations where family members put drugs into a person's food or drink, and that's also, of course, a violation. So I think there's a lot to talk about there, but I would encourage you to, to take a look at my presentation in Galway, I'm not sure if I have that. Not sure if I have that here or somewhere else, but I will try to find it and um, and make sure. I think I may have it in the materials for legal capacity, but I will try to find that and and. Um, Make sure, but yeah, here it is. It's in the materials on legal capacity. Um, this free and informed consent and the right to refuse treatment. The slides and and the video could could be helpful on that. And I would I would appreciate you know any further discussion. I think that would that's definitely a worthwhile thing to look at. One other resource to think about, and I will give it as a kind of qualified thing to look at. <laughs> The, the World Health Organization, they're developing these training modules on mental health and human rights, more or less. Mental health and human rights, it's part of their quality rights project. And there are some, some very mixed materials in there. So I would like to say, I would like to recognize that they are developing some materials they're they're working on um these issues and at the same time i've in, in my review of them i've i've made a, a lot of criticisms so i i i honor that the world health organization is is um accepting the premise of the crpd that that forced and coerced interventions have to be abolished I don't think they're they're upholding that 
in every way that they need to throughout the materials. But if, if you have time and interest to wade through some of those materials, it's worth reflecting on what they're doing, what they're promoting, and whether it's actually, you know, to what extent it, it, it does uphold the CRPD standards. I think I'm not sure, actually, to what extent they're even really dealing with this question, though, about whether in a good faith situation, um, what are really the obstacles to exercising free and informed consent. So I guess just leaving that as another possibility, but some, something to discuss more. And I thank you very much for the, for the question and comment and, and look forward to any more discussion. And thank you all for, for joining me today. I look forward to receiving your assignments and very happy to be with you. Um, ending the lecture now when I figure out how to do it. Um, where do I am? Okay. Okay, goodbye. Thank you.